other churches with, who are like-minded and who are uh, pur- uh, purposed on fulfilling what we are talking about, acts to the ends of the earth. So as we continue in our study, we're going to be in chapter 8. Oh, sorry, kids. Everyone's waving at me. I thought they must just like, like what I'm doing. All right, kids can go ahead and stand up. And they can head to their classes with their teachers. <laughs> All right. If you point and wave long enough, I'll eventually get it. So, Well, as we continue, we're going to start now in chapter 8 of the book of Acts. So if you're joining us, uh, you can go ahead and turn your Bible to Acts chapter 8. How many of you are, would consider yourself planners? How many planners do we have in the room? All right. So I see some spouses like, you know. But planner, I would, I would say I, in some aspects, I would consider myself a planner. A planner likes to have everything thought through and laid out, right? If you're going to do something, whether it's something big or something small, you like to think through, think this is how it's going to work. This is the sequence in which it's going to go. And if it goes this way, then it's going to turn out fine because I've planned it. You know, the funny thing about our plans is that we often think that our plans are the best, right? Our plan is the best plan. If it could only go the way I want it to go, then we're going to be good. But how do we react when things don't go according to plan? When things don't go according to plan, it reveals a lot about who we are, who we truly are. So I want us to go ahead, and we're going to see this in this passage this morning. I want us to go ahead and read. You can follow along as I read aloud. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It says, Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen, and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. So as we read this, if you remember last week, we talked about Stephen, who was one of the seven men chosen in Acts chapter 6. And he was chosen to serve the church. And it says in Acts chapter 7 how he went about doing great things, preaching the word, healing people about the work of God, but it didn't go over well with the religious leaders. And so they challenged him and ended up, he made them so angry that he was presenting Jesus as the Messiah that they stoned him to death. So that's where we left off. And here we enter in on chapter 8, and it seems like a pretty bleak situation. Stephen is dead. The disciples are scattered they have to leave because th- th- they will be killed as well if they don't. So they, they flee. They're on the run. Saul is hunting down Christians, going house to house, throwing them in prison. Many of them, if they do not recant what they believe about Jesus, will be put to death. What hope is there for the church? We see in, he- in chapter 8, We come to a point where we're thinking back to just a few chapters before when we talked about the unstoppable church. Remember that? The unstoppable church. How do we get from there to here? If God is in it, we said, who could overcome it? But it seems that from these verses that they are in a pretty rough spot. Things are not going according to plan. We see at the beginning here, it starts in verse 1, of the persecution that started really with the apostles as they were brought before the Sanhedrin twice. The first time they were given a warning. They went out. They didn't obey the warning. They continued to preach Jesus. Then they, they came back and were brought before them again, and this time they were beaten and sent out. And now it culminates with Stephen preaching the gospel brought before the religious rulers, and they can't take it anymore. And they kill him, the first Christian martyr in the church. This persecution we see from verse 1 that it was instigated by Saul. 
He was there at the stoning of Stephen. It says that they laid down the garments at his feet. He was not only part of it, but he was, he was uh, um, pushing it forward. And even greater so in verse 3, we see that he was the one that was going from house to house. It says ravaging the church. Saul was the face of persecution among the Christians. They knew him. They knew he, what he was capable of. They knew that he would stop at nothing to wipe out the church. He uses the word there, ravaging. This gives us the picture of a wild beast that is tearing its prey apart and devouring it. Quite a, a, a mental picture there. Ravaging the church would stop at nothing, was ferocious. He wanted to see this Jesus gospel, this news about Jesus being the Messiah, wiped out. And he was going to do everything he could to stop it. Now, if you know the continued story of the, the growth of the church, you know that Saul, something amazing is going to happen in his life. And we'll get there. But at this point, he was the main persecutor of the church. This persecution had been building and culminated in the stoning of Stephen. And so as a church, we don't see this today. We get to, to worship freely without fear of someone breaking down those doors and coming in and dragging us off. And we thank God for that. But as a church, we do not fear persecution. We do not fear persecution. In fact, as a church, we should expect it. We don't live our lives trying to, to move around so that we don't face any persecution, so that our lives are comfortable. In fact, as Christians, we expect persecution. John 15, 18 through 20. It says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. And you were, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This is what Jesus said to his disciples and that rings true for us as well. So as a church, we thank God that we don't face the same persecution but at the same time, we don't fear it. And so uh, we need to understand that as we dig into this chapter and see the state of the church at this time. We see and just have a short account of Stephen's burial. We won't spend much time on that. But really, it was most likely done by Jewish Christians that were remaining behind. Or it was done by Jewish uh, People that weren't, didn't believe in Jesus but were sympathetic to the Christians. Either way, whoever did it, this was at great risk because those who were stoned for blasphemy were not supposed to have these rites of burial rites. They were not supposed to be mourned over, but these men did because they recognized the truth. They recognized the heart behind what Stephen was saying. So as he is buried we see in this whole situation a confirmation that Israel had rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Really, it's a sad day in the turning point of history. It's exciting for the church because the church is growing and spreading out, but it is a sad day for Israel, for God's chosen people. Because the gospel had been presented to them again and again and again and again, they had rejected it. So now what happens, the gospel moves from Jerusalem and out, and we begin to see this pattern. If we remember, all the way back to the first chapter of the book of Acts, verse 8, this is where we get our theme. Right before the, uh, he left the disciples um, and ascended up into heaven, Jesus laid out a plan for the spread of the gospel. This is where we get to the ends of the earth, our series title for the book of Acts. Verse 8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. All right, check, that's happened, right? Remember at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down, had empowered the church to do amazing things, to grow and to spread. And so that part is complete. It goes on to say, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, reading that, if we're unfamiliar with the story of what comes, then we might think like probably many of the disciples thought. Well, this gospel, 
this message of Jesus as a Messiah offering salvation is, is going to grow and grow and grow and just overflow until it reaches around the world. It's going to be so popular. People, yes, there will be people that reject it. We know that that's true. But overall, a majority of people, I mean, this is Jesus offering salvation. They should be excited about this. And the gospel would just overflow out of Jerusalem into all of the world. And so, if this was their plan in their mind of how this would be accomplished, these three verses at the beginning of chapter 8 would come as a surprise for them. What's happening? It's not even, God's own people are rejecting this message. How can it possibly spread to the ends of the earth? Here we are, eight chapters in, and it seems like God's plan isn't working. What's going on? Now back to my planners in the room. It's frustrating to have a plan in our minds. You, there's a situation. You've planned it all out. You know how it should happen. But then someone else comes in, and they start doing it their own way. And of course, remember, my way is the best way. So they're doing it the wrong way, and you, it's hard to watch, isn't it? You, if you have kids or been around kids, you deal with this all the time. But what's worse than that is when that person does it the wrong way, and they are successful, and probably even more so than you would have been if you tried it, right? Especially when they're your kids. That's even harder. You're telling them, no, you can't do it. That, it's not going to, okay, yeah, I guess it worked. Okay, uh, I can, now I can't say anything anymore. But we often face that. That is a dose of humility. But if I was with an expert, say I was fishing or out doing something, if I was with an expert in that field, whatever it was, and I had my plan, and their plan differed from mine, if I was wise, I would step back and say, all right, whatever you want to do, let's follow your plan, not mine. I had an idea, but I would rather go with what you say because you know what's best. And we would submit to that. But we know this, that the always faithful and ever present God that we learned about in Stephen's sermon last week is active and working in every situation like this. In fact, this isn't a setback in his plan. This is the plan. This is what God had planned from the beginning and he is working his plan. We reach these points in our lives often, don't we? Maybe it's not these exact same circumstances but we face hardships, setbacks, frustrations, derailed plans and hopes and dreams. In fact, we face these even when we are trying to do what is right. Even when we are trying to pursue what God has for us, we face these times in our lives. The church wasn't doing anything wrong. They were excited about the gospel. They were proclaiming it. They wouldn't let the, the religious leaders quiet them down. And instead of a reward, it looks like they just got persecuted. What could God possibly be doing? I want to remind us this morning that in the midst of frustrated plans and deferred hopes, God is still powerfully at work in, our, in your life, in my life. And he's sovereignly orchestrating his better plan. And we see that in verse 4. Let's read that together. We read 1 through 3. Let's look at verse 4. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. I love that verse. Because it comes after this, oh, all hope is lost. We tried to build the church. Now Stephen's dead. They're going after us. We have to flee. You know, what's left? But here is the hope that we have in that verse. That all those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Our main idea this morning is this. God's plan to reach the world with his truth is and always has been a faithful church that scatters throughout the nations preaching the word. A faithful church is one that scatters. And we see this word twice. Once in verse 1. And then again in verse 4, talking about the church fleeing this persecution, they're scattering all throughout the surrounding region. We must have a heart for the world around us. God said, it's time. 
The people around Jerusalem need to hear the good news of the gospel because I love them. It's the same thing today. We gather within these four walls, and they're nice white walls, aren't they? If you've noticed, and maybe even smell a little bit of paint, that's why. We got new paint, and we're grateful for that. But we do, our church is more than just inside these four walls. We have to have a love for the people outside of this church, in our community, in our work, in our families. We have to have a heart for the world around us. We see it in the early church. It says that when they scattered, they went to Judea and Samaria. Remember, this, this echoes what Jesus predicted in Acts 1.8. He said, first you're going to go to Jerusalem. And then you're going to go where? Judea and Samaria. Why is Samaria so shocking? Well, technically, this is still a part of what we would call the Holy Land. And mostly Jews lived there. They had intermarried. But Jews, they were Jewish people. But they were outcasts from Jerusalem. And this was a logical next step for the gospel to spread. Jerusalem and then into Samaria. But the Samaritans, they only followed the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So there was this great divide between them. And we remember seeing that through the Gospels. Remember the, the story of Jesus as he traveled, decided to go through Samaria. And the disciples said, hey, I, aren't we supposed to go around? I, we don't want to deal with those people. They're not like us. And Jesus said no. And he had the conversation with the woman at the well. There was a great divide between these people. But they too were waiting for a Messiah. Moses had promised this. And when the Jewish people were doing well, the Samaritans claimed to be a part of them. When they weren't doing so well, they kind of stepped back and kept their distance. But there was a long history of division between these two people. But the urgency of the gospel compels us to set aside prejudices and to love people as Christ loved us. We look at our community around us Right, there's some people that are hard to love. Right? We probably don't even have to look outside these four walls to find people like that. No, no pointing fingers. But we set those things aside for the sake of the gospel because of the urgency of the message that we have. And that's what these Jewish Christians did. As they scattered, they went to the very place that had been off limits for them. And they shared the good news of God's word. Not only should we have a heart for the world around us, but we must have a heart to send, not to gather. To send, not to gather. We don't always know how the scattering will happen, do we? For these disciples, it was because of persecution. They had to leave. They had to flee for their lives. But sometimes it's because God moves us different places. Maybe he puts on our heart that he wants us to go somewhere. We don't always know how it will happen. But so many churches today are focused on building their empire instead of building God's kingdom. Too often we measure the success or the health of a church by the number of people in the pews. I know we don't have pews, but imagine. By the number of people that are sitting here. We, have, we talk to people, well, how many are in your church? How many does your church have? And we try to gather and gather and build up what we're doing instead of focusing on the greater mission that God has given to us. It's my prayer that our church never becomes focused on that. Just getting people in here so that we can have bigger numbers and, and do more things. We need to be a, a church focused on sending. Because we understand this, that we will have the maximum impact for the gospel if we are a multiplying church. That's God's design. For us as individuals to, to multiply, but us as churches to be multiplying. That's why when we hop on a call like we did this morning, and we get to see the church in Beaverton, Oregon, that we've been partnering with, that that's an exciting thing. And I hope that as we grow as a church, we have more and more opportunities to send people out to plant more churches, because that's how the gospel spreads. We must be a multiplying church. That means training and equipping people to go. It means planting churches. It means sending out missionaries. We can never be content with just building what we have on this property. We need to be focused on what God is doing throughout the world. 
the word that's used here, it says the disciples were scattered. The word is uh, diaspero, which is diaspora. Does that word sound familiar? When people are sent out, they have to leave a certain place and they're spread out all over the place. Diaspora. But it's a word that's often used with describing how we sow seed. I know we don't do this anymore, but back in those times, they would have a bag and they would grab the seeds and they would scatter them. They would throw them out to plant the seeds. And that gives us a wonderful picture of what God is doing with the church and the Christians that were in Jerusalem. A seed is not effective if they are piled up in one place, are they? If you just drop the bag and said, here, we'll just plant them here. They'll, they'll make their way out to different places. It doesn't work that way. They must be scattered. It's casting out with intentionality. This doesn't mean that you have to pack your bags and move across the world. I'm not telling you that. But it might mean that if God is calling you to that. But what it does mean is that when we go outside of these doors, we are going with a purpose. Wherever God has scattered you, in your neighborhood, your workplace, your school, wherever he has you, are you being an effective witness? What happens to a seed when it gets scattered? When it falls into the ground, makes its way into the dirt, has some water, what does it do? It grows. These Christians were scattered out through seemingly negative circumstances and they were planted in all of these regions around Judea and Samaria and they began to grow. And the gospel was moved in that way. So we see, one, that a faithful church scatters. It's not just about what's here. It's about sending out, multiplying, being a witness when we go outside of these doors. Secondly, and the, my last point is this, that a faithful church preaches the word. God's word is primary. You say, Reed, we hear you say that every Sunday. Good. I probably need to say it more often. This is the foundation of everything that we do. And it should be our foundation as we go out, and it was for the early church. Their, their buildings were probably destroyed their houses, they, it says that, that Saul went in the houses and arrested people. They had no building like this, but they had God's word. And they went and they took it wherever they went. We cannot be effective witnesses without the truth of the gospel. If our acts of love and kindness are not accompanied by the word of truth, we are not meeting, meeting people's greatest need. We are not being effective in the way that God has called us to be effective. It's good to be kind. It's good to help others. But if at the end of that, there is no pointing them to the truth of God's word, we have not done what we've been called to do. We must preach God's word. We point people to the truth of the gospel, but the Spirit is the one who works in their hearts. So when people reject you, that's why most of us are afraid to share the truth because we're afraid of rejection, right? I'll be honest. I'll, maybe I'll just speak for myself. Like, what are they going to think of me? What if they say no? They're not rejecting me as a person. They're rejecting God's truth. The Spirit is the one who works in their heart. But I have been called to faithfully proclaim God's word. And I must do that. As we see in Acts 8, here in these verses, rejection leads to proclamation. The disciples could have easily thought, Man, if God's own chosen people aren't going to accept this, why would I waste my time going out in these other areas? But because it was rejected there in Jerusalem, it forced them to go out, and they remained faithful to their calling and shared the gospel with these Samaritans and others that they came into contact with, and they believed, and the church grew. We have to be faithful and know that even when people reject us, God is working his plan, his better plan. We are all called to preach the word. You think, well, I, I, I can't preach. I'm not talking about standing up here and talking to a group of people. Here, the disciples, when it says they went out preaching the word. How did this next phase of God's plan begin? Not through a well-devised plan, not through a well-funded missions program, not through a specialized evangelist 
taking to the streets, a, a core team of people who are just out there on, you know, they're trained and they're going in. It wasn't done by that. It was done by ordinary followers of God who were faithful in following what God had called them to do. They lived out their mission wherever they went. That's not just me. That's everyone. You're sitting there, you're thinking, well, I don't know. How do I share that? What do I do? Notice that this was not a specialized group of missionaries. The apostles actually stayed there in Jerusalem to help the church continue to be led and grow there. This was the whole church that went out. This is you. What is your part in this mission? Let me get to that word, preach. The NIV says this in that verse. It says, they preached the word wherever they went. This is not referring to, to preaching a sermon. It simply means to bring the good news. It means that I am sharing with others the good news that has changed my life. You ask, I don't know how to do that. Well, if your life has been changed, share your story. Tell others what God has done for you. You don't have to have a specific outline and hit all of these points, but you do need to point to the truth of the gospel. And you can do that by telling your story. All of us can do that, right? We can all tell stories, especially when it's something that's personal and means a lot to us. Going out wherever we, we go and preaching the gospel simply means this. Wherever I go, I'm talking to people. I'm pointing them to Jesus. I'm saying, look how God has changed my life. And he can do the same for you. This is what we are called to do. This is God's chosen means of spreading his church. So as we conclude, we remember our main idea is this. God's plan to reach the world with his truth is and always has been a faithful church that scatters throughout the nations doing what? Preaching the word. So as we end, our so what's going to be a little bit different, but I'm going to give you four characteristics of a Christian on mission, of a, I was going to say a scattered Christian, but that, I don't mean some Christian who's walking around like, I don't know what's happening. I had that track somewhere in my pocket. Now, a Christian that is scattered out, sent out, living on mission. It's you and me. When we go out of these doors, when we go home, when we go to our work, when we are out in our neighborhood, we are living purposefully. How do we do that? First of all, we have to be willing to go. This is probably the biggest first hurdle to get over. God is going to lead and direct you in your life. Are you willing to go? And I don't mean that means pack up and leave here. But being, being open to God's leading. I think there are a lot of people that have felt God's call to go be missionaries somewhere that have suppressed that because it's uncomfortable. For many of us, God has called us right here. And being willing to go means, are you willing to, to walk over and engage in conversation with your neighbor? Or talk to that person at the store? Or to start that conversation at your workplace? If you're able. But to use every opportunity and to be willing to go out and be an effective witness for the gospel. Secondly, a Christian on mission must be committed to grow. Wherever God has placed you, be committed to growing. A seed that just lies there dormant does no good. Whatever context God has placed you in, dig into his word, know his word. Grow in your own faith so that you can grow up and impact those who are around you. That's what these Christians did. They were sent out, scattered out, and landed in all these different areas, but they continued to grow in their walk with God and share it with others. C committed to grow. Know that God has placed you where he has you for a purpose. Commit to thriving in your relationship with him in that context so that you can impact people. And how do we do that? Thirdly, we have to be faithful to preach. Willing to go, committed to grow. I know I didn't keep them rhyming, but faithful to preach. Second Corinthians, as I only read for us this morning, 2 verses 14 through 16 says this. But thanks be to God 
who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are the aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. In your workplace, as you go around, as you are are involved with other people, do you have an aroma of Christ? It's quite a, a, a nice way to describe that, right? We're very sensitive to smells. You can be around people, you can smell different things. When people are around us, do they notice Christ? Or are they surprised when they find out that you're a Christian? God has placed us in the different places he has us for a purpose and a reason. Are we faithfully preaching God's word? Do they know what we believe? Do we have an aroma of Christ pointing people to the life that he offers? And then finally, are we dedicated to the word? As we live out the gospel, first of all, do we know God's word? Do we know the truth of the gospel? If we don't know it, how do we point people to it? It means study his word. Know it so that we can faithfully proclaim it to others. Because this is our only hope. This is what we ground ourselves to. This is God's word, and this is God's word alone. This is what I desire for our church, for myself. We don't always know the plan, but we can trust the one who does who has the better plan for us. We must be faithful to pursue the mission that God has called us to, as a church and as individuals, to boldly proclaim his word to the ends of the earth. Let's pray together.